for your faithfulness. Amazing Lord, how far you have come. We're grateful for all you have done for us time and again. Year after year, the miracles, great and small to Timely provisions have come through again and again. We want to say thank you, Lord, thank you for sunshine of rain. Wholeheartedly, thank you, Lord, thank you. We'll say it. You are 
and welcome to IES Online Service. My name is Tirza and I'm the digital pastor here at IES. And I want to take the time to welcome all of you here today, especially if this is your first time visiting or checking out our online service. We would love to get to know you. So there will be a QR code on the screen and a link in the chat. So if you just click on that real quick right now and fill out a simple form, we would love to get to know you and give you a little bit of information about IES and about our IES online ministries. Friends, today we are going to talk about finances. <laughs> so a lot of fun, but we're talking about it through the lens of change and changing. How can we be transformed in our financial health? Um, so Pastor Dave is going to bring the word. It's going to be exciting. Enjoy the service. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It's so good to see you all here and those of you who are online. My name is Katie, and I am usually downstairs with the preteens, so it's great to see you all here. Now, it sounds like IES was very busy today. We had Bloom happening with teens. We had a father's legacy happening with all of the, the fathers downstairs. We had a life group training, and I actually had a life group that took place today as well. That's how I spent my Saturday afternoon. And at my life group, we were talking about relational health and friendship and all of that. And something that I really was impacted in and really thought about was how the Bible talks about where two or more are gathered. I'm with you also, right? Where two or more of us gather together, the Holy Spirit is there with us, and he is moving, and he is working in our midst. And I see a lot more than two of us here tonight. So I know that God is going to be moving in this place, that he is here, his presence is resting and upon us. And so I want to uh, just open us in a word of prayer and invite his presence in, knowing that he is going to change and transform our lives tonight. Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you that you are here with us. We thank you that we are never alone, but you walk with us through every season, through every moment, Lord. We ask that you would come and you would fill this place, that you would move on our behalf, Lord, that, that you would hear our prayers and you would answer them tonight, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done today with all the different events that have been taking place, Lord, and, and how you've spoken to us and you've challenged us, Lord God. And we pray that tonight you would just continue to do those things, that you would continue to speak to our hearts, that you would continue to comfort and to, to transform us from the inside out. Lord, we worship you in this place. We lift your name on high. You are worthy to be praised. And all the glory and all the honor belongs to you, our King and our Savior. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Let's stand on our feet. Let's worship the Lord. Let's remember his goodness, his love, and his great great power. Our God is not limited by anything. He is more than able to help us in all kinds of situations that we are in. And I also want to welcome our friends who are watching online. Come and let's worship with us. Sing with us.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of His Spirit and washed in His blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Yes. Oh, I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I know the
my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Yes. I will never walk alone. I've never been abandoned. You are my inheritance. You are my strength and she and I am confident. You go before me. You're my deliverer. I know I never walk alone. Never been abandoned. You are my inheritance. You are my strength, and she and I am confident. You go before me. You're my deliverer. I know I need. references in the songs that are like references from old times you know we, we talk about God being a shield and a deliverer and I, I don't know how many of us have ever actually used a shield here I, I don't know what kind of you know battles that you've been in or different things like that but 
I guess in a modern sense we think of like the Lord being our Kevlar or, you know, or some, something like that. But we know enough about the use of the language and we know enough about the Old Testament and things that we, we can understand those figures of speech. As we go to the Lord tonight, I want us to really think about how those things apply in our lives. I want us to begin our prayer time by lifting up our own personal needs. And for all of us who are here, for all of us who are in the online service, we want you to just identify some needs in your own life, some things that you need God to do. And think of him as the one who not only delivers you, but he protects you from the things that may be attacking you. And then I'm going to give you some other things that we're going to pray about. But let's take a moment to do that first. Can you just do that? Can you just think of things in your own life, things that you need God to do, and maybe some things that he needs to protect you from. And then just lift those to the Lord and just ask him, to protect you and to be with you. Jesus. Now we, we want to go to the place where we're going to be praying one for another. And for those people who are online, you have a button you can push that's like raising your hand to be prayed for. And, and everybody here, we're going to ask those of you who have a need to to also raise your hand so that other people can be praying for you. I want to ask all of you to, to pray for my wife. Uh, the last few days she's not been feeling well, just kind of like a low-grade fever. And I, I, we're going, uh, we're leaving tomorrow night and she's going to spend a, a wonderful week of having them tear her jaw bones and things apart and put new things in and, you know, the, the dental implants and all that. And I thought she better be well before we started that or, you know, it wasn't going to make a lot of sense. So please pray for her that the Lord would touch her and whatever it is that she's feeling feverish for. And then we'll be with her next week and protect her through all that surgery. Just a few minutes ago, I got a, a, a note by Edwin, who's been a part of our church from the, for a long time. He's uh, suffering from a fairly serious infection and he's in hospital and having uh, antibiotics treatment and things like that. So we need to pray for him for a real touch of healing. And we want to pray for, uh, in addition to these two who are sick, we want to pray for anybody who's here. Uh, let me specify this. Let's pray for anybody who has a physical need. So you're sick or you have health issues or you have something going on in, in, in your body. Maybe it's not just a disease. Maybe it's you're your getting old. Uh, that would be me, but uh, you know, all of those other kinds of things that are going on, you need prayer for something. In addition to my wife and Pi Edwin, for those of you who have physical needs, would you raise your hand and, and I've got mine as well, and then let's pray one for another. Can we do that? And just look for somebody who has their hand raised or lift up the people that we've been mentioning in prayer. Let's, let's go to the Lord for all of those things. Father, we just lift one another up, Lord. I, I lift up Gigi to you, Lord. I pray that you would just bring healing to her and touch her. I pray that whatever is causing this uh, low-grade fever and just this fatigue that she's facing to be cleaned up, Lord, and taken care of. And then next week, I pray that all of this different surgery and things that they're going to be doing would just go well and it would heal properly and that all of the process of, of surgeries and healings and things like that that will be done next week and then in the months to come, Lord, would go well. Lift up I Edwin to you, Lord. We pray that you would just touch him and bring healing to him. We pray for each and every person who's here who has physical needs, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a fatigue, whether it's a, something not working well. We lift up Christian, uh, Director Christian's father to you, Lord. He's just suffering with just really extreme pain. We pray that a way to, to bring healing to him and touch him would, would be found and the doctors would be able to, to be able to decide how to treat him and how to take care of all of these things, Father. And as a church, we come together at this time, Lord, not only praying for all of these needs, but we lift up and pray, Lord, about the succession plan that we have as a church. As this process moves forward, Lord, we pray that, that everyone would be able to embrace this process. And we pray that everybody, there wouldn't be misunderstandings and that everyone would understand how uh, in the way that you've led us as a church, Lord, this is always something that we've always had to deal with. And we know that your hand is upon us and you'll be leading us in all of these things. So we lift up all these needs to you, Lord. We pray all these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. Now, every time I see that tree, I'm going to think of Pastor David Stanislaus because he said that's like the only tree in Kansas there. And so, yeah, that was good. That was good. Uh, I want to just invite all of you to um, take out your phones and go ahead and, if you haven't yet downloaded, 
the Church Center app. You should do that if you have downloaded the Church Center app. Uh, just go ahead and, and do your check-in. Again, uh, very, very interesting information that we get by finding out all these different things and all of a sudden my, my, my phone wanted to tell me that it's not me. You know, my thumb is the wrong one, so I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure whether I like the idea of using thumbprints because if somebody steals my phone, I don't want them to have to cut off my finger to get my information, so anyway. Um, I, uh, very, very interesting. We, we've shared a few things with you from the congregational profile, and as we mentioned, we've done this over and over, and I thought this was a really, really interesting statistic. Uh, and so we're going to throw that one up there. Uh, look at this. Uh, congregational survey result. When did you start attending IES for adults? Now, we're, we're, the church is 24, almost 25 years old, and yet 45% of the people who attend here actually now in IES actually started attending since we moved to TCC, since we, uh, since we started operating after COVID. Isn't that interesting? So out of our group of people that we have here tonight, uh, let's say there's about 150 of you, half of you, almost half of you, didn't come to IES before we were here. So my question is, where were you? And uh, well, you know, how did that happen? But you know what else is interesting? If you do the same question to the teenagers, it turns out it's almost the exact same number. 45.5% of the teenagers have only been coming. Uh, Tears and I, Pastor Tears and I were talking about it earlier in the service. That's a pretty remarkable number because we were shut down for two years for COVID, right? And during that time, some of those seniors moved and went off to college or they did move when things opened up, but we didn't have kids church and so there were like nobody moving up. And so Pastor Josh has kind of rebuilt it from really almost nothing. So we need to be really thankful for Pastor Josh and, and all of the things that he's done and, and uh, we're really thankful. I think a lot of the parents come here because of their teens. Uh, I'm not sure if they're teens. Well, I guess we did have one last week. Yeah. They said, uh, how did you end up coming to IES? And they said, my parents kidnapped me. So I, I guess for some of you, that's a good thing. All right, so this whole thing is changed and changing. And we're, we're using the word transformation. We're also using the word changing. And we've been covering these seven key areas in our life. We talked about spiritual health, physical health, mental health, emotional health. Last month, we talked about relational health. This month, we're going to talk about financial health. I want to tell you a funny story. I'm not saying this because I'm saying that the Lord showed it to me. But I had prepared to do an, a, a little thing that I do when we talk about giving and things like that. I had prepared to do something with the story of the widow and the two mites, the two small coins. I have those kind of coins. I've always found that story interesting. And when I first went to Israel years ago, I bought some of those coins. And I felt like I should put them together in one of the illustrations. And so I have them in my office, in my desk. Not all of them, but some of them. And the video crew came in. They sat at my desk. And, and I tried to record an offering lesson using those two coins as an illustration. And I think we shot about 10 or 12. And none of them worked. Now, you have to understand, I, I'm, not, I'm not a perfectionist. So generally speaking, when I do a video, it's one and done. You know, sometimes like I'll be in like five minutes, eight minutes into it, and I'll go, blah, 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 let's start all over. But a lot of times I'll just go, blah, blah, blah and they stop and they re-edit it back in. I've never gone that many times without being able to do it. And every time I did it, it was worse. And I thought about that, and that's why I ended up with a video that you just saw. I just prayed for people. Because my conclusion was, now I may be wrong, I'm not saying the Lord told me this. My conclusion was that by using that illustration to talk about people's giving, I might say something that might be misunderstood. And if you're a pastor, or if you've been around churches, you know that misunderstandings over finance is one of the most serious misunderstandings that exist. When IES was a year and a half old, there was a young man who lived in another town. I won't say where it was, except it was Katawachi. And, um, and he had been in the church since almost the beginning. And he left. And he left angry. And he said, I just can't stand it. All that Pastor Dave does is preach about giving. So uh, people told me what he said. I, I looked through all my sermons. In a year and a half, I had preached 70-something sermons. And I had only preached on giving once. And it was in relationship to missions, not to giving to the church. It was about 
giving out, not giving in. And I thought, you know, that guy must have really a guilty conscience to be so obsessed with that topic. So my conclusion is that before I told you about the two widows' coins, I don't want anybody to be offended, so I need to teach you about how to change the way you see and use money. And that's actually our sixth of our determining factors or the changes that we want to talk about. The next one after this is going to change the way we view working and we view employment. Most of us are employed. We either work for somebody else or we work for ourselves. Say, oh, Pastor Dave, I'm, you know, I'm retired. Then you're working for yourself. I'm, I'm a stay-at-home housewife. Then you're working for yourself. Anyway, I don't mean that as an insult. But next week, we're going to have our missions, talk about our missions. This week, we're going to talk about how should we as Christians change the way we see and use money. Would you all stand to your feet? We're going to read a long passage of Scripture. And I uh, want to just encourage you to read with this with enthusiasm. And then we're going to use this to help us to understand certain things that God wants us to understand about, about, about money. Let's read, starting at verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be a manager any longer. Please read with me, please. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with real riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's pray. Father, help us to come into this with this idea of allowing your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to things about money and about this world that we perhaps have not seen before. Lord, it is our intention to live every aspect of our life transformed in what you want it to be. And we've talked about all these different areas, spiritual areas, relational areas, family areas, all these things, Lord. And now we're going to talk about how we relate to the things of this world, the, the treasures of this world. Help us to have understanding, Lord, not to close our ears, not to close our hearts, but to listen to what it is that you really want to say as we try and understand what you want us to know. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, please take your seats again. Now, I'm going to talk about several things here, and uh, I want you to, to follow along. Now, I'm not suggesting that all, uh, although this parable is a very valuable parable, and there's a lot of interesting things here, I'm not suggesting that it is entirely and completely intended to teach these lessons. I'm just saying that this is a good way to remember these lessons. These lessons illustrate some of these principles. The first thing I'm going to start off with is, what is it that you are not supposed to do with money? What is it that you're not supposed to do with money? The first thing is, you're not supposed to let money corrupt you. You are not supposed to let money corrupt you. We have to acknowledge if we understand that money is often a curse instead of what it's often referred to in the church circles in Indonesia, which people call it a blessing. When most people in, in church talk about blessing, oh, I got a blessing, I gave a blessing, blah, 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 they're talking about money. That's not biblical at all, at all. 
And we need to understand that the reason money is so dangerous, it has the potential to corrupt us. Most people consider their Christian life through a, 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 a lens of transactional process. In other words, I think of money in this transactional way where God rewards me for my faithfulness, rewards me for my service in, in some kind of transactional way. I do the things I'm supposed to do. I don't do the things I'm supposed to do. I pray the way I'm supposed to do. I serve the way I'm supposed to do. And I'm supposed to get something back. Over and over and over, I've had people tell me, Pastor Dave, you know, I have this business and Mr. Smith has this business. And I'm in two life groups and Mr. Smith doesn't go to a life group. And my kids go to Sunday school and Mr. Smith doesn't go to Sunday school. And I treat my wife right and Mr. Smith doesn't treat his wife right. And my business and his business, he's doing better than me. Why? You understand what I'm saying? We view our reality of our spirituality and money in a transactional way. When we view it that way, we have been corrupted because we brought it into a place where it never should be. Don't ever think of money as being an end that justifies any means. It is not an end. Now we're gonna talk about what money is in the kingdom of God, but it, we've gotta make sure we don't let it be in something that would corrupt us. Do not look for signs of God's favor in money. That is true corruption. If I start thinking, oh man, I, I got this thing like that, that must be because God is pleased with me. That's corruption. We're thinking of it the wrong way. That's just as corrupt as anybody who would use money to try and manipulate other people. If you're gonna try and use money to manipulate God, that's worse, okay? Don't let money corrupt you. Number two, don't waste money. The whole reason for this parable that are being told is because there's a rich man and he has a manager and the manager is accused of wasting his possession. Wasting money is clearly wrong. None of us would ever hire a steward who would do with that with what he's given. Now, one of my favorite stories that I heard years and years and years ago was about a man who was looking for a new driver. And so he called the drivers over and he told them, he said, I wanna show you this place. I want you to imagine how close you can go, how fast can you go around that corner, how close can you get to the edge of the road without falling over. The first guy drives and he goes a certain speed and he gets pretty close. The next guy says, I can go faster, I can go closer, and he gets closer. And he gets the third guy to go in the car and the third guy says, I quit, I don't want your job. I'm not gonna drive in a dangerous way. I don't wanna work for you if you're gonna expect me to drive dangerously, too fast and too close to the edge. And he said to the third guy, you're hired. Nobody wants, well, sometimes maybe in Jakarta, but nobody wants a driver who will take risks. I am sure that all of you here, if you have two drivers and one is dangerous and one is not dangerous, you take the dangerous one for yourself because you want the safer one to drive your loved ones. Always we wanna make sure that money is, that the manager is somebody who can handle all of these things. Don't waste the things that you have. Number three, don't love money and don't live for money. So I've heard people say to me, Pastor Dave, I don't love money. I spend it all as soon as I get it. As soon as I get it, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, so you may not love money, but you're living for money. And it's really kind of the same thing. In, in this passage in verse 13, at the tail end of this story, Jesus says that no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the word that's actually used there for money is the word mammon. And mammon is not just a, a, a word that means the same thing as money. Mammon is actually the God of money. Uh, uh, Kamala, our business manager, is gonna be preaching in two weeks. And that's one of the things he's gonna talk about as he does the remix on that. Fourth, don't trust money for security. Don't trust money for security. Again, in this same story in verse three, the manager said, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Are you ashamed to beg? Are you strong enough to dig? If your security is in money or your begging ability or your strength to dig ditches or in anything other than God, your security is in the wrong thing or the wrong place. I've used this illustration before, but I'll never forget it. I've been in the Philippines during the transition, during the People's Revolution in the Philippines. And I lived 150 meters away from the house where Cory Aquino lived. 
And they would not pick up the garbage on our street. And they would not pave our street. They would not take care of our street. The police wouldn't patrol our street because the people in power didn't like her. And then the People's Power Revolution came along. And don't assume you know which side I'm on and any of that kind of stuff. All I know is that when I left, I went up to Baguio on a Sunday. And when I went up to Baguio, the street had not been paved and the garbage was never picked up. And during the time I was gone, she became the president. And by the time I came home, my street had been wonderfully paved. And the garbage was picked up three times a week. Now the problem was, is all those people who had based and counted on their future and all of their security on their relationship with one set of leaders, now all of a sudden had to deal with a lot of other leaders. The thing that they thought made them valuable and important all of a sudden made them at high risk from the new people who were in charge. Don't trust those things. Proverbs says, in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. It will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Man, haven't we seen that? You know, in the United States, so they, they do all this thing with the big lotteries. And all of the big, big, big mega lotteries, like, you know, multiples of millions of dollars. Almost 50% of the people who win those things declare bankruptcy within five years. Why? Because what they thought gave them security, or the, the, the big word now is generational wealth, actually didn't. It didn't last for that kind of a thing at all. Number five, don't expect money to satisfy. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10 says, Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. You know, I could line up a whole bunch of people here that I know who could stand up here one by one and tell you that money doesn't bring happiness. Some of those miserable people I know are some of the richest people I know. Because you can see that, they, that it doesn't provide happiness. But statistically, there's another interesting story. A number of years ago, when the monetary crisis was, was first going on, Michael Ramsden, who's one of my favorite preachers, Michael Ramsden came, and he spoke on the real value of money. He had done a paper when he was in school on uh, the crisis, the potential crisis in the monetary system when we had transitioned from money that had value in itself, coins and things like that, or even paper money, to money that didn't really exist anywhere except in the flow of neutrons, electrons between different banks and things. And everybody thought it was ridiculous until, if you remember, when it all melted down. And he talked about this, and they did a survey in the UK, okay? They wanted to ask people, they surveyed people and said, how much more money do you need in order to be satisfied with what you earn. And they asked people in three different groups, people that made 100,000 pounds a year, people that made 200,000 pounds a year, and people that made 500,000 pounds a year. And you know what they said? 100,000 pounds a year, well, how much more do you need to be happy? They said 30%. 200,000 pounds a year, how much money do you need to be, more, to be happy? 30% more, 30% more. 500,000 pounds a year, how much do you need? 30% more. In fact, the most famous story, and I don't know if it's true, it could be an urban legend, that one time when John D. Rockefeller, who at that time was the wealthiest man in the world, and historically one of the wealthiest men ever, and they asked him, how much money does it really take to satisfy? And he said, just a little bit more. <laughs> Folks, don't expect money to satisfy. It won't. It just doesn't work that way. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus said, Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. When I was a young man, there was a, there was a sign, a bumper sticker that said, the one with the most toys when he dies wins. I've been with a lot of people when they died. I've never, ever met anyone who was dying who cared about what they owned. And they're making a difference. All right. And then number six, and I think this is maybe, maybe I'll just say it. We don't need to talk about it, but I think it should be obvious. Don't think that money makes you better than others. Now look, folks, this is Jakarta. And in Jakarta, money, how much somebody makes is one of the critical ways that people judge them. I was sharing with the guys, I talked with the fathers today. You know, in my business, it's not about that. In my business, if you're a pastor, the one that makes you successful or not successful is how many people go to your church. When you need another pastor, you talk for a while, and then you say, oh, how many people go to your church? You don't come right out and say it, but you hint around, you know. You know, you know. How, how big is your facility? How many people can you seat? How many services do you have? How full is it? You know, you're just working your way around to the same question. And I know what that's like. 
I love it when people ask me, oh, you have a little English service in Jakarta. How many people go to your church? Oh, uh, you know, 1,000, 1,500, you know, something like that. But I know that you're in business, most of you are in business. And the way the score is kept is money. But just because you have more money than somebody else doesn't mean you're better than them. Don't ever see what you have as a sign of God's favor. Now, look, don't misunderstand me. You should be thankful for what you have. But there's a difference between being thankful and thinking it makes you better. In one, you're saying, thank you, God, for everything you provided for me. In others, you're saying, thank you, God, for everything I deserve to be provided with. And there's a huge difference. Okay, so how do you combat this? This is so important for us as a church. This is so important for us as Christians. We are trying in every single way to be as countercultural as we can possibly be. What are the things that we need to remember? What do we remember? Number one, everything belongs to God. Everything you have belongs to God. You see, Pastor Dave, I had this opportunity and I worked hard. Okay, who gave you the opportunity? Who gave you the skills to work? Who gave you the ability to work? God. Everything you have belongs to God. There, the, in, in verse 1 of that story, Jesus is telling a parable. And please note, this is a confusing parable. And one of the reasons it's confusing is a parable. I was reminded in one of the sources I was reading, and the guy said in the source, he said, look at this. He said, it's a parable. It doesn't have to be logical. You can make people in a parable say whatever you want. I'll talk to you what that's about. Jesus told his disciples, there's a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Whose possessions were they? They were the rich man's, not the manager's. You are managers, not the owner's. Number two, we need to understand that God is using money to test us. Why does God use money to test us? Because it works. We are tested in the things that have meaning to us. We are tested in the things that matter to us. Why? Number one, money tests us because it shows what I love the most. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, I, the message translation says this. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place where you will most want to be and where you will end up being. For me, there's a really clear illustration of that in my own life, my wife's own life. You know, we're retiring, as you know. I'm getting too old and, you know, I, I know you're willing to sit here and listen to me talk while I sit in a chair, but by the time I'm lying on a bed and talking, it's just going to be too silly so that we're going to leave. That's a joke. It's okay to laugh. And people always say, where will you go? And there's a really easy answer. You ask me, you ask my wife, everything that we say, it all boils down to one thing. Where will our daughter be? Because she's our treasure. And we will be where she is. We will go where she is, right? Because where your treasure is, what you value the most, that's where your heart is. So what do you love the most? Number two, it shows what I trust. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Do not trust in anything that can be taken away. Can you, can you just stop for a minute and ask yourself the question, what do I have that can be taken away? Don't, don't put your trust in it. Health, your health can just go. Your family, you can lose your family. Your friends, the only thing you really have that can't be taken away from you is your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. I can, I can introduce you to people who are prisoners and in, in prisoner of war camps, I can introduce you to people who got to know Jesus in the darkest prisons as they were terrible criminals. And once they knew Jesus, there was nothing that could take them away, that they could take him away. And then it shows if God can trust me. This is good. In, verse, in Luke 16, through, uh, 16, verse 11 and 12, Jesus says, If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who is going to trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you the property of your own? Years ago, I, I heard a story that um, it had a huge impact on me. And then 
Fairly recently, I heard something else that actually kind of broke my heart. Uh, I will, I will, I think I have the details all the way correct, but I will be very oblique in my story because I may have it wrong and I don't want to end up blaming the wrong person. The story I heard about was a man who came into the middle part of Europe and felt like God had called him into a city to plant a church. And it was going to be a different church. He was not from that country. He's not even European. He felt like God had called him. And, and so he was praying and said, you know, Lord, what is it you want me to do? And, and the Lord said, I want you to promise me that you will care for my most valued and my most precious children. And he, he, was, he was kind of thrilled because he thought he's going to be able to be the pastor of important people. And it sounded really good. And so he said, yes, Lord. I will take care of your most valuable and your most precious. And the Lord brought him into a ministry of reaching out to orphans and prostitutes on the street, street children, people in the most terrible of circumstances. And the Lord said to him, these are my greatest treasures. And so he threw himself into it. And by serving and working and gathering people the Lord was able to do remarkable things. And at the time that I heard of this interview, he was now all of a sudden pastoring one of the largest Christian communities in that part of the world. And it was built up out of that kind of ministry. People that nobody else wanted. But they were precious to the Lord. And just fairly recently, I asked somebody who knew about that story and that person. I asked them, I said, do you know what's happened? And they said, oh yeah, yeah. That, that church and that ministry is gone. Because it turned out years down the road, all the attention and all the things that happened, that pastor became corrupted. And he stole from his own congregation. And he got caught. And that ministry was destroyed. What are the true riches that are in your life? What has the Lord given you? Have you been trustworthy in how you have used what he has given you? Let me say to all of you, I just did a thing for fathers today. As a father, if not the most valuable thing, among the most valuable must be your children and the relationship you have. Have you been trustworthy? God sees, God knows but our lack of ability to be trustworthy is exposed in the way that we handle the things of this world. Now, make sure you understand, this is not just physical wealth. I'm not talking about the price of gold. I'm not talking about all these things. Oh, but isn't it funny? You remember when they started inventing platinum cards? You know why they invented platinum cards? Because they, they needed something better than a gold card because platinum was worth more than gold. I, you all know that platinum's not worth more than gold anymore. I don't know if they have to switch around and platinum cards become less important or what are we going to do, go with like iridium cards or saffron cards or, you know, whatever. But it's not just physical wealth. You have talents, you have opportunities, you have influence, you have many other things. Can God trust you with more of those things? If you've not been trustworthy with what he's given you, is he going to give you something of your own? The third thing that you need to remember every day is money is a tool for God's purpose. In the Bible, money, in the New Testament, money is only a tool. Money is never seen in the New Testament as a reward. Now, in the Old Testament, it's an agrarian society. A, a person who was successful as a farmer was successful because they had rain and they had God's provision and all those things. It's a different setup in the New Testament. Money is only a tool and it's a tool to be used for God's purpose. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into your eternal dwellings. What? If, if, this, if this parable doesn't make you say, huh? Then you've not really read it very carefully. The first thing, I, I'm not going to go into a long extended explanation. I'm just going to say, the first thing the master is the guy in the parable, not Jesus. Jesus is not commending the shrewd manager. And all the master is looking at him and saying, 
Oh yeah, well, at least he stole, but when he was stealing from me, he actually at least was smart enough to use his theft to protect himself. God's not saying you should do that. He's saying, what does the Bible tell us? Even a bad father wouldn't give his son a stone when he asked for bread. How much more your father in heaven? And what, what, this is that same kind of an idea that God, that a man who shrewdly uses what he has to, to advance himself is smart. But we who have so much more on the line, this guy did these things so he could go to people's houses and have a free meal. You and I are in a place when we're talking about eternal dwellings. How much more should we be doing these things? What is God's purpose in the world today? This is an oblique text, but it applies in our modern world, not obliquely at all. God's purpose in the world today is for us to help others. God's purpose in our world today is to love our neighbor as ourselves. God's purpose in the world today is to share the gospel with other people. In John chapter 9, man, that was, my, that was our soap thing. Eight times this week I read John chapter 9. Jesus went and looked for the beggar who had been healed. And he said, do you want to believe in the Son of Man? And he said, whoever he is, I'll believe him. You tell me. I trust you because you healed me. That's the PD version. And he said, I'm the one. And he said, Lord, I believe. One of God's great purposes is to bring people to faith in God to reconcile people through Jesus Christ. Number four, the best use of everything is in God's kingdom. That's why it says in verse 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. In the same way that the manager used stolen wealth to give himself a place to go. Use what God has given you to prepare yourself. Number five, one day we will give an account to God. You and I are managers of what we have, just like this man in the story. If there's no manager in this story, there is no story. The parable is about managing. Understand that? No, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know, a, a parable is like a joke. If it's told well, it, it works well. And in and, and this story, it works because there's somebody who has it, somebody else is managing it, and he manipulates it at the end. He, he doesn't just say, I'm going to lose it all, but he does something before he loses it. And what God wants us to understand is everything we have comes from him. If I am faithful with what I have, God can trust me with more. Matthew 25, verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Our motive in all of these things is faithfulness. It is not getting more. It is faithfulness. But the way we handle money is a designation. That's not the right word. The way we handle money clearly shows, clearly shows how faithful we are. Maybe more clearly than anything else. There have been all throughout the world communities that have been built up on all kinds of different ideas. Historically, there have been a number of Christian communities that have been built up on the idea that wealth is bad. They, they go from, a, from some people on the extreme of, of faith style all the way up to liberation theology and things like that, that all the problems in the world relate to money, social injustice. There's a lot of truth in that, by the way, but it's not correct biblically. The Bible never says it. There also is a whole bunch of theology that's been built around this idea of money is the right thing. It's what God gives. It's what God gives to those he's pleased with. And like the guy, the wise man said, yeah, that's right. That's why the devil tempted Jesus with the wealth of the world. It's not the symbol of what God does. Over and over and over, I've asked the Lord to help me and I, yes, to talk to you about money because I know it is so sensitive. But we must have a godly perspective on wealth and we need to have changed the way that we see and view money, not because God somehow needs us, but because we need to have a hold of this and understand it. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I've asked the Lord, what is the message that I am supposed to give to you? And the same thing comes back to me over and over and over. And these are the things I want you to remember. I want you to remember all the other stuff I said, but this is what the Lord has to say to you. Everything you have is from God. Everything. 
Everything you have is from God. That's important to know. If you know that and accept it and believe it, it will change an awful lot about your life. Number two, God is happy for you to have what you have and enjoy it in godly ways. I, I don't believe for a minute that God wants all of his people to be poor. I also don't believe he wants all of his people to be rich. The New Testament is full of people. Some are poor, some are rich. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to God, and it doesn't matter to his church. Now, there are rules and things like that, but God's okay with that. Number three, when he tells you to give it and where to give it, you have to give it because it's not yours, it's his. When you think of it as yours, you're not the manager anymore. Let's make sure that we learn from this lesson and recast the way that we see money in this world. What do we view it as? And how do we use it? And make sure we never let it use us. Let's pray. And I'm going to pray for you. I invite you all to stand. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray a benediction over you. And then we're going to sing a benediction song. Please keep my wife in your prayers. We're going to hope that she can be well enough to do all the surgeries and stuff like that that need to happen next week. And be in prayer for us. I'll be traveling with her. And uh, well, I'll be with her for that time. So let's look to the Lord. Then Pastor Misha will lead us in a benediction song. Father, I just lift up to you each and every person here, Lord. We are, we are so influenced in our lives by the world and the perspective of this world. There are so many things that this world has to say about the value and, 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 and properties and things and money and, and all of these things. And Lord, we know that, that the lesson of the world is not right, it's not accurate, and it's not godly. And yet it's so hard for us to work ourselves free from those things. Lord, I pray that, that everyone who has listened to this message will take some of the things that I've said, some of the scriptures that we've read, and most importantly, some of the things that your Holy Spirit says to them. And help us to be recasting these things in our life. Help us if we look down on others. Help us if we elevate ourselves. Help us if we want to help nobody, or help us if we don't use the things that we have in a way that pleases you. But help us to not let it be about things, but let it be about you. Make us good managers, excellent managers, and help your kingdom to be grown through us. My brothers and my sisters, I pray that you would understand that God made everything that exists because he loved us and he wanted to create us. Amazing gift of him. Understand that Jesus had everything. He was God. And he surrendered all of that to not just be a human, but to be the most crushed and despised human dying on a cross. And then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to be in our lives, to empower us and to enable us to live in our everyday lives the way that he instructs us to be. And I pray that you will remember these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love mercy, 
and walk humbly Cause I belong to you Bless you and have a great weekend. Thank you so much for joining us this service. We hope you were blessed uh, by the service. And please come again next week or share and tune in again throughout the week. Uh, friends, so we want you to save the date November 2nd and 3rd. It's the first weekend of November. It is our 25th anniversary. Can you imagine that? IES turns 25 this year. And so we have some exciting things happening. And if you happen to be in Jakarta or you can plan to be in Jakarta, please come and join us and celebrate God's goodness and God's faithfulness over the past 25 years. We love you guys. And we're going to see you next week for another online service. Have a great week. 